was first thinking about preaching on the topic of hope, I thought it would be a nice, light, happy message, particularly after the last one I preached on stealing. It was kind of a heavy one. But then I started to think about some of the stories that I hear where hope is not so easy. And then came the flood. And so this message isn't going to be quite as light and happy as I anticipated. But I hope that it will um, help us to live more in hope than maybe um, some of us have been able to do in the past. But what does hope look like in the face of a broken world and a broken life? How do we hold on to hope in the midst of a devastating flood? A child who's chosen a destructive path? Pain and illness? Broken relationships? How do we continue to hope in the face of depression, grief, loss? What do we hope for and what or who do we hope in? These are some of the questions I've been struggling and wrestling with over the last weeks. What exactly is hope? Now, some dictionary definitions say hope is the state which promotes the belief in good outcomes related to events and circumstances in one's life. Hope is the feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best or the act of looking forward to something with desire and reasonable confidence, or feeling that something desired may happen. According to the Holman Bible Dictionary, hope is a trustful expectation, particularly with reference to the fulfillment of God's promises. Hope is the anticipation of a favorable outcome under God's guidance, the confidence that what God has done for us in the past guarantees our participation in what God will do in the future. So hope is very future-oriented, and it's a very important concept in the Bible and in our lives. In fact, I would say it's impossible to live well without hope. Now, Job was a man whose story is told in the Old Testament. And he is actually one of my favorite Bible characters because he is shamelessly honest about his struggles. When he loses everything, his home, his wealth, his family, his health, as you will hear, he doesn't sugarcoat his complaints to God. He tells it like it is. In fact, he has some pretty hopeless things to say about hope. And sometimes when I look at the suffering around me, I can identify with Job. In Job 6, 11 to 13, he says, What strength do I have that I should still hope? What prospects that I should be patient? Do I have the strength of stone? Is my flesh bronze? Do I have any power to help myself now that success has been driven from me? In Job 19.10, he says, He tears me down on every side till I am gone. He uproots my hope like a tree. And then in Job 30.26, he says, Yet when I hoped for good, evil came. When I looked for light, then came darkness. But then in the middle of all this loss and the hopelessness he expresses, he also expresses hope in God. In Job 13, 15, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. In these verses and in the whole book of Job, Job seems to vacillate between hope and despair, between trusting and accusing God. Jeremiah is another person in the Old Testament who struggled with hope. He wrote the book called Lamentations, which kind of tells you how happy that book is. In the midst of a world falling apart, 
And some of you may be able to identify with that feeling right now. The Book of Lamentations follows the structure of Hebrew poetry and the, the main point, the climax, is right in the middle of the book. And that climax is a powerful expression of hoping in God after all that I had hoped for is gone. I'm going to read a fairly lengthy passage and I just invite you to listen or read along. So Lamentations chapter 3, starting at verse 13, reads, He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughingstock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I, will, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them well and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. These are not the words of a naive optimist. These are the words who has experienced suffering beyond what most of us could even imagine. He uses some strong language to express how much he is suffering. Pierced heart, broken teeth, trampled in the dust, bitterness and gall. I don't know how many of you know Jeremiah's story, but after being persecuted by his own people for prophesying disaster, he then lived through the disaster he had foretold. And that disaster was the destruction of Jerusalem and the carrying off into exile of his people. So Jeremiah knew what it meant to suffer. Both Job and Jeremiah expressed their hopelessness and grief and their hope. When we hear about hope, I think we're rarely encouraged to admit and express the feelings that seem to contradict it. But I believe that we can only experience authentic hope, true hope, when we're honest about the things that seem to oppose it. So naive optimism is different than hope. Hope is also different than expectations or expectation. Gerald May in the book Awakened Heart uh, describes the difference between hope and expectation. In the abstract, hope is a wish for something. Expectation is assuming it is actually going to happen. False expectations only breed trouble. By contrast, there is no such thing as false hope. Hope deepens our love pre precisely because it does not have to be bound by experience. A child who has always gone hungry cannot expect the next meal to be full, but surely and rightly can hope. Because hope always admits of its uncertainty, it can be disappointed, but never killed. It's always open-ended. I've experienced this difference myself, and I think often in our culture, we're actually we're encouraged to have expectations more than we are to have hope. We often have a closed idea of what is good or what ought to be the experience of our life, what the outcome should be in situations. We're told in almost every place that we look that we deserve 
to be healthy, prosperous, and happy. These expectations can actually lead to the death of hope, of true hope, because this isn't the reality of our, of our experience, of our global experience. It may be true in some particulars, maybe in some particular moments, but it's not true as a whole. None of us are exempt from personal suffering, whether that be small or great. And we don't have to look very far to see some who are suffering greatly, particularly today, just down the road, in fact. But probably even closer than that, maybe the person beside you or a friend that just needs some help and support. Gordon Smith, uh, who he's a president of Ambrose University College and uh, writes about um, discernment a lot. And um, in his book, A Holy Meal, he says, an authentic hope is one that sees reality clearly. To live in hope demands a realism about our world, that we see the world the way it is. What hope gives us is the capacity to recognize that what we see is not the last word. So what is the last word then? If what we see isn't it, what is it? And what is it that gives us the capacity to hope without denying reality? 1 Peter 1, 3 to 6 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus, of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. I'll read part of that passage again. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. New birth, living hope, an inheritance that is indestructible. And all of this through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We were reminded last week, both through uh, John's message and as we celebrated communion together, that this is, this is the truth. The death and resurrection of Jesus brings new life and brings hope. The truth is that death is followed by resurrection and new birth. In the scriptures, Old Testament and New, in narrative, poetry, and in the letters, there's a common thread. Our hope is in God, not in safe houses, prosperity, comfort, perfect families, or even good health. Our hope is in Jesus because he is the one who brings new life out of death. Does this mean that it's easy or natural to hope? For some, I think it is. Some just have a capacity to hope that amazes me. But for some, it isn't. And sometimes in our life, it isn't. A friend of mine was uh, reminding me of a, when I told her I was preaching on hope, she reminded me of a situation in her life. I asked her if she, I could share the story, and she agreed. Several years ago, she was living around Chilliwack, and it was a very difficult period in her life, a time of really deep personal suffering. 
And she was working a little bit of a drive away from Chilliwack. And when she would drive home, she said every day, she would drive several kilometers out of her way so that she could pass the sign leading to hope. And that carried her through. That helped her to hold on to hope in a situation that was extremely stressful and difficult. Carlo Corretto writes in the book, The God Who Comes, I do not believe there is a more difficult task in the world than living on faith, hope, and love. We have to make a leap into the darkness, or more precisely, into the invisible. Now that statement may surprise some of you. No more difficult task in the world than living in faith, hope, and love. But I I think it's true. (laughs) Um, Sometimes we're introduced to faith as an analgesic. Just believe in Jesus and everything will be okay. Not really true, is it? Um, Faith is difficult. Hope is difficult, and love may be the most difficult of all. There are times in our, in our life when we need help to hold on to hope. A highway sign is one way to remember, but a community who will hope for us, maybe when we can't hope for ourselves, is another. I spent last evening with some old friends, um, some that I haven't seen for too long to name. <laughs> And we spent some time catching up and reminiscing, and then we shared a little bit about the struggles and challenges that are present in our lives. And my hope has been bolstered by that time together. I know many people who have hope who don't believe in Jesus. They don't have faith in Jesus. They have a capacity to trust that all will work out for the best. And I admire that. But I guess I'm a little bit more pessimistic than they are. Because without Jesus, honestly, I can't see how things are going to turn out for the best. Now, I want to make it clear that I'm not saying um, that in order for people to experience hope or to see good things come out of bad things, that they have to have a personal faith in Jesus. But what I am saying, and I do believe, is that whether there is faith in God or not, He is the source of our hope. He is the source of all that is good and true and healing in our world. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is the Creator and the Redeemer of all that is. And I'm grateful that His grace extends to all that He has created. And certainly we see that in the response of many people who maybe don't have a personal faith in God or in Jesus in our city in these days, when people have responded with compassion and hope and active service for others. And I'm grateful for that and for God's goodness expressed in that, whether people own or acknowledge that or not. As Christians, what we are to hope for and in, what we are to hope in is the reality of redemption being more powerful than the fall. We are to hope in God's grace and presence being more real and foundational than brokenness and sin. When we have a relationship with Jesus, it doesn't mean that everything will be okay in the sense that we don't experience suffering and brokenness. It does mean that we can experience Jesus' presence that we can be honest about our doubts, about the moments when we don't feel hope. 
and it means that grace is active in and through the very brokenness that we experience. It also means that we can give ourselves to making all things new in active ways, to repairing damaged houses, to reclaiming what is good and true in this world. We can also hope, ultimately, for that day when all things will be made new. And I don't, this isn't a message on the end times or the theology of heaven, but I do believe, ultimately, all things will be made new. And we can hope in that when it seems like there isn't very much to hope in today.